Good afternoon and welcome to the Rancho Mirage Public Library and Observatory. My name is Susan Cook and I am the program's librarian here at the library. Uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, how many of you have been here for all three of Bill's lectures? Once again, sold out. Um, I want to be sure that we thank Mrs. Roberta Peters, the lovely Mrs. Roberta Peters, who makes it possible for Bill to come out every year. And she gave me a little surprise, and it's really a surprise for you all. Um, she has invited and will sponsor Bill's trip next year in January, annually. So, please. Thank you. I, I don't think Bill needs an introduction. I think Bill, speak, Bill speaks for himself. Um, he does give a wonderful brand of American history for us, and I know you all love him. So please give him a nice, warm Rancho Mirage Library welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> ah, there you go. Why would I start with Peggy O'Neill? And I have a bone to pick with you women. How come you gasped when I said the 60-year-old married in 19? What if it was a man, a six-year-old man, where that wouldn't have been so bad? I don't know. We're the feminists here. Okay. Uh, but, but or no, that would be the opposite. All right, Colonna, you just put your foot in your mouth. All right, Peggy O'Neill, uh, how did she cause the Civil War? Uh, no, this was an argument. I, I had a professor, and he was, he's still alive, and he's one of the prominent, undoubtedly, top five Jacksonians in the country yet. But uh, his argument was this. Calhoun, you'd have to concede that Calhoun eventually led the South into the Civil War. Even though Calhoun died in 1850, it was his theories of nullification and secession, and he was one of the spearheads of the movement to secede, even though, again, he was dead 11 years before the war. But Calhoun, up to this point, thought he was going to be president. And had he become president, I don't think he ever would have become a secessionist, because he would have been president of the United States, and he would have had some obligation after that to protect the country and all that. So what broke him, when he didn't become president, then he reverted back to his old sectionalistic ideas. And the question was, at this point, who would succeed Jackson? Would it be Calhoun, his vice president, or Van Buren, his secretary of state? And the odds were on Calhoun at first, because Calhoun was a fellow Southerner, Van Buren was from New York, and Calhoun was a slave owner like Jackson, a lot of similarities. But then uh, J Jackson had a few arguments with Calhoun about uh, when Calhoun was secretary of war and Jackson was a general. Uh, Calhoun made a couple remarks about Jackson that didn't come out for a long time. And, he, Jackson was angry at Calhoun for that, for impugning his military abilities, because uh, Calhoun had really never been in the service. But, but anyway, uh, so they were beginning to drift apart, and then came the uh, O'Neill affair, the Eaton affair, where uh, Calhoun, and his, because of his wife, Floride, you remember, stood against Peggy. Van Buren, the widower, had no trouble chumming up to Peggy, uh, and therefore Jackson, who liked Peggy, because he saw in Peggy this woman maligned by high society, he saw his Rachel, his beloved Rachel. So that was another wedge between Van Buren or between Jackson and Van Buren. And then is going to come the nullification crisis uh, in 1832-33, which I talked about. And and at that point, Calhoun was so estranged from Jackson, partly because of the Eaton affair, that he actually resigned the vice presidency went back to South Carolina, was immediately appointed pre uh, senator, and came back to Washington to really harass Jackson. So that when, in, when the election of 1832 rolls around, which is what I'm going to start with today, uh, Jackson has to pick a new vice president, and guess who he picks? Van Buren. And in 1836, when Jackson decided not to run again for a third term, uh, partly because he was very ill, uh, uh, who does he pick as his successor? Martin Van Buren. And uh, Van Buren wins the election of 1836. That could have been Calhoun. Now, had Calhoun become president, would have he kept emphasizing secession and nullification, all that? Maybe not. And what drove him away from the presidency was Peggy Eaton, so therefore she caused the Civil War. Uh, that and slavery and secession. 
but certainly Peggy O'Neill. Uh, but, but that's like, when, uh, well, anyway, we'll let that one go. Okay, so the election of 1832. Uh, it revolves around the bank of the United States. It's often called the bank election. There were other issues, and the nominees were eventually Henry Clay for the National Republicans and Jackson for what's now called the Democrats. And there was a, and the National Republicans would, by 1836, call themselves Whigs. I did emphasize that. And eventually, most Northern Whigs, when the Whig Party self destructed, in the 1850s, arguing over slavery, North and South, most Northern Whigs, in fact, virtually all Northern and Western Whigs, became Republicans when the Republican Party was formed in 1854, including Abraham Lincoln, who was a lifetime Whig. His idol was Henry Clay. In fact, Lincoln always had in his office a picture of Henry Clay just like Trump has a picture of Stormy Dan, I mean Melania. Uh, uh, in the office, okay. Uh, I don't know. All right, so, and there was a, also in 1832, I have to mention, I'm gonna go over this fairly boom, 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 so I could get into some stuff on their similarities and contrast to Trump and, and Jackson. Uh, in 1832, you had the first major third party in American history, and eventually it got 8% of the vote and seven electoral votes. It was the Anti-Mason Party, which had formed in the mid-1820s. The Anti-Mason Party originated in western New York. Uh, there, the Ma everybody thought the Masons were controlling the country. Jackson was a Mason, Clay was a Mason, the highest rank you could get. George Washington was a Mason, Benjamin Franklin was a Mason. Thomas Jefferson, most of our presidents, uh, somebody, uh, at least 30 of our presidents either admitted to being Masons or were Masons. You know what the Masons are, the Freemasons, the Shriners. They do a lot of good, and now it's kind of an open thing. But back then, it was a very secretive organization, and many people thought the Masons really ran the country. Uh, and again, only men could participate in Masonry, and then only men were really involved in politics. Da, 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 da. And there was a, a man in western New York in 1826 by name of William Morgan, who had been a Mason, but barely, and he was thrown out of his lodge. And he was threatening to write a book to expose the secrets of Masonry. And he was uh, framed, I think, for a little minor offense, put in jail. He was kidnapped out of jail, and he was murdered. His body was never found. They thought they might have found his body, uh, but they didn't have, it was so rotted away from being in the Niagara River that they couldn't really tell. Nowadays, they maybe could have, but back then it was just a guess. And anyway, this started a movement called anti-masonry, and it swept really the Northeast and Pennsylvania, and even a little bit of the Midwest, what we now call the Midwest. And by 1832, the Masons, the anti-Masons, either on their own or in conjunction with the National Republicans, uh, they had elected governors and congressmen and senators, and many people thought the anti-Masons were gonna be a major party because the Democrats were really new yet, the National Republicans were really new. So in 1832, you had two dynamic guys running for president, the immortal Andrew Jackson, the gallant Henry Clay, you had the anti-Masons who nominated a guy, I know you're dying to hear this, William Wirt, who was a little squirt, they said, uh, but uh, who did the anti-Masons nominate in 1832? Now what nerd wouldn't know that, William Wirt, and he did carry Vermont, he was, did carry one state. But the anti-Masons also were the first party ever to hold a national nominating convention to nominate work. They said they were against elitism, like the Masons were an elite group, uh, so they were against elitism, and they didn't like these caucuses and state legislatures nominating people. So they held a national convention, uh, and they nominated work, and they even... First time in history, they wrote a platform, a very clear political platform. Here's what we're going to do if Wirtz elected. And it was very simply written in a very good, uh, precise platform, I think, for 1832. Uh, and then it was so effective, and it's so scared to be jabbers out of the other major parties that the Democrats held a convention, and so did the National Republicans. And from that time on, 
uh, every major candidate has been nominated by a convention. The Democrats have never missed a convention since 1832. Uh, this is big back east when I give the lecture, it means nothing here. But the conventions, all three were held in Baltimore. And they now would have been all mugged, murdered, whatever. All right, uh, but back then it was a relatively safe uh, city, okay? So uh, yeah, the, so we had a third party, we had platforms, we had conventions. And this was really the beginning in many ways of the second two-party system, which would pit the Democrats eventually against the Whigs. I'll get ahead of it. And, uh, Henry Clay's gonna lose. And in 1834, Henry Clay made a speech in which he suggested that the uh, National Republicans and that the uh, uh, anti-Masons come together, even though Clay was a high-ranking Mason, that they come together and form a new party to oppose Jackson, King Andrew, so they took the name Whigs, I did tell you that. And then from the mid-1830s to the mid-1850s, it was the Democrats against the Whigs, fair enough? Okay, and that was, I did tell you, W-H-I-G-S and all that kind of stuff. All right, so in 1832, the election uh, centered around a bank because the second bank of the United States was chartered in 1816. Supposed to run until 1836, it was given a 20 year charter. I did explain the National Bank, right? This was not chartered by a state, but by the Congress, could practice all over the country. It issued paper money, the only paper money that was really good. Uh, every bank could issue paper money these days, believe it or not, but most banks' paper money wasn't worth anything. The Bank of the United States, was their paper money was the only thing resembling a national paper currency we'd really have until uh, the Federal Reserve System was started in 1913. So the second bank was centered in Philadelphia, headed by Nicholas Biddle. It was the second greatest bank in the world. Did the bank have flaws? Yes. Did it bribe some politicians? Yes. Do banks bribe politicians today? If you don't think so, I'll sell you to Brooklyn Bridge right after class. <laughs> All right, sure. I mean, the, uh, I, my historian uh, mentor used to say, Bill, the Bank of the United States did not need crushing, it only needed curbing. What the bank should have been is regulated a little more tightly by the national government, but it shouldn't have been crushed. It was the best thing we had. It was our most reliable financial institution. Only one-fifth of it, however, was controlled by the federal government. Only 20% of its board of directors was governmental, and yet it handled all the government money. Jackson had never really taken a stand on the National Bank. He was leery. He tended to like business, but small business, not big business. Jackson always favored small businessmen over big business. Mm, okay, so there was some feeling he liked banks, maybe. He, he was burned in a bank deal once, but it was his own fault, and he realized it. But he really had not, nothing against banks, but the Bank of the United States was elitist. Da, 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 da. All right, so Jackson, if I were Nicholas Biddle in the bank, I would have kept my mouth shut. Hard for me to do, I know. Uh, and it was hard for Nicholas Biddle. Uh, he should have just played it cool, hoped that Jackson let things right out, and maybe the bank could have been rechartered for another 20 years in 1835, a non-election year, and by 1836, everybody would have been singing Kumbaya. Okay, but to make a long story simple, Biddle fell for a scheme pulled off by Henry Clay and the other National Republican Whig leader, Daniel Webster, the great Daniel Webster. They convinced Biddle to ask for a recharter four years early, in 1832. Their argument was the bank was so good for the country and so powerful and so popular that Jackson would, and Clay promised to get it through Congress, which he did a recharter bill. And he said, if Jackson signs the bill, which he'll probably have to do, then you've got 20 more years. 24 more, because you still have four, then you get 20 more. If Jackson has the guts to veto the bill, then you're going to beat him because the people hate Jackson for vetoing the bank. So either way, you win, Biddle. But what about if Jackson wins? Then you made an enemy of Jackson. And Jackson, like Trump, tended to look at things black and white. You're either my friend or you're not, one way or the other. And that's not necessarily bad in politics. So that, but that's certainly the way Jackson was, and Biddle should have seen it. But he didn't, and he falls for it. Clay gets to recharter Bill through, and Jackson vetoes it. The most famous veto in, in all of American presidential history to this point was the veto of the bank. And except for 
maybe Truman's veto of Taft-Hartley uh, in 1947, which was overridden uh, by Congress uh, at that time, uh, did maybe one of the most, the most famous veto ever, really. Uh, the veto of the National Bank, the veto of Maysville, Jackson, when he vetoed, he made him very famous. All right, so now the election of 1832 turned on the bank. But lo and behold, guess what? Jackson wins. He carries all the red states. South Carolina, you wonder why that's gray. South Carolina was the only state still appointing electors, and they voted, they told their electors, the state legislature appointed their electors and told them to vote for John Floyd. Uh, Work, the anti Mason carried 8% of the popular vote, but he only carried Vermont with the help of Bernie Sanders, and he. Uh, <laughs> He was actually to the left of Bernie. Oh, that's impossible. Okay, uh, but, uh, okay, I'll be fair. That was Lenin. Oh, I mean, no, no, no. Uh, see, I could be fair. All right, but anyway, uh, Jackson carried the red states. He, now, what's amazing to me, and how popular was Jackson? Although, again, he only got 55% of the vote. Clay got 38 and uh, uh, 37, and, and Wirt got 7. So, again, a 55-45 split like Jackson got in 1828. Most people voted the same way they did. Uh, the amazing thing is, why did Pennsylvania, which and even New York, but especially Pennsylvania, the National Bank's headquarters were in Philadelphia on Chestnut Street. When I first went to Philly, I was in high school yet, and we're going to an Eagles game, and I asked my dad to take me to Chestnut Street. He said, what the hell do you want to go to Chestnut Street? I want to see the Bank of the United States building. I wasn't a nerd, was I? I but I could, I could tell you this, and I'm going to tell you. I, I, I'm a big Eagles fan. I was, but I'm rooting against them this, this weekend and next week if they make it in the Super Bowl. Because I could say, I was in a stadium the last time the Eagles won the championship in 1960. Yeah, I know you don't think I'm that old, but I was in, I was there when the Eagles won. That's the last time. It's the only playoff game Vince Lombardi ever lost. He was coaching Green Bay. And I was in the stadium a couple years later when they snowballed Santa Claus. And you believe it, they snowballed Santa Claus, the Eagles fan, because I was there. All right. But anyway, Jackson wins for the same reasons he won in 1828. He had a good organization and he took Van Buren as his vice president and it made it fairly obvious that Van Buren was going to be the Democratic nominee in 1836. Calhoun was now on the outs. Calhoun would never become president. And now for the next uh, 18 years of his life, he dedicated himself to trying to bring the South an independent status. And that's where the Peggy O'Neill thing and everything comes in. All right. Uh, there's uh, that's 1836. Did I all I have? I did removals. I did all that. Did I not? Okay, the bank. Oh, the bank war. Do I have that there? Where, where, where? Whoa, no. I guess I. All right. Let me go back though. Wait, Bill. Okay. What happens now? Jackson wins. It's November of 1832. The bank technically has a charter to run to the end of 1836. But now Jackson, instead of letting the sleeping dog rest, Jackson now decides he's going to destroy the bank. He was very ill when Van Buren met him one day, and he said, Van Buren, the bank is trying to kill me, but I will kill the bank. And he now decides whether it's legal or not. He didn't even bother asking lawyers for advice. He just withheld all government deposits from the bank, probably illegal. Congress had ordered that all government money go to the bank till 1836. Jackson said, nah, I'm going to give the money to state banks. And eventually picked out 89 state banks that were called the pet banks. Most of them, coincidentally, about 75 of them were owned by Democrats who favored Jackson. All right, but he now begins to take the money, not out of the bank, but he won't put any new money in the bank. So within a couple of years, the bank is not going to have any federal money. So the bank is going to just atrophy. And uh, th this caused a furor. Uh, people claimed it was illegal. Uh, his first secretary of Treasury wouldn't withhold the funds. So ja Jackson fired him. 
talk about a turnover in the Trump administration so far. It was a, Jackson had just fired his whole cabinet member over the O'Neill thing or asked him to resign. Now he gets rid of three secretaries of the Treasury till he finally find one, finds one that will withhold the deposits. A guy named Roger Taney, who will eventually become Chief Justice, big Jacksonian. Uh, but, but anyway, Jackson now gets involved in what's called a bank war. And Biddle fights back by not giving loans, by trying to withdraw loans, by putting pressure on local banks. By, when he held their bank notes, he now goes back to these local banks, says, give me the specie, knowing he'll maybe ruin those local banks. So we have terrible economic turmoil. Imagine Trump or Obama declaring war on General Motors or saying, I'm going to destroy Ford Motor Company. What would that do to the economy? I mean, my God. And here's Jackson just trying to destroy uh, the second bank of the United States. Whether he was right, wrong, or in between, it causes turmoil. And here's where I, it got me yesterday. My nerdishness came out. CNN made mistakes. Fox News made mistakes. God knows those two never do. All right. That didn't get much of a laugh. OK. Uh, <laughs> Now I know how Bob Hope used to feel when he bombed one. All right, uh, uh, the Senate of the United States, for the first and only time in its history, censured, censured, C-E-N-S-U-R-E-D, censured Jackson for withholding funds from the bank against the will of Congress. A censure means nothing but a slap on the wrist. Doesn't mean anything. There have been many censure uh, proposals against Trump and against Obama, so what? All right. The Senate, never before or never since, has censured a president. That censure came in 1834, and it was expunged in a political deal in 1837. But it was on the books for three years. The Senate never, never censured another president. The House of Representatives kind of did. Uh, on a couple of occasions, one of Jackson's protégés, Polk, was censured, John Tyler. It's, people argue Lincoln was censured, maybe it was kind of a, kind of a censure, uh, but no big deal. It, but Jackson was angry about it. He finally made a deal in 1837, just as he was leaving office, uh, and uh, the censure was expunged. But when they say no president, uh, Jackson was the only president ever censured, yes, by the Senate, but the House of Representatives on two, maybe three occasions. Uh, I say maybe because that Lincoln thing is still up in the air. And James Buchanan was censured after he left office. How the hell do you censure a guy when he's no longer president? I, uh, but you know, you think Congress is goofy now. Uh, what, what about back then? All right, so that was the bank war, the Bank of the United States. Again, I think the bank did far more good than harm. It was our best financial institution, second best financial institution in the world. Should have we kept a closer eye on it? Yeah. Should have Biddle been maybe a little less abrasive? Mm -hmm. But should have we destroyed it? No. It wouldn't do us any good to destroy General Motors or Ford Motor Company or anything like that. All right? So what about Jackson and foreign policy? He really didn't have much of a foreign policy. He was a, we weren't a world power. We, we weren't invading everybody in the world. Uh, we weren't having soldiers in 87 countries. We, we didn't have atom bombs. Thank God South Carolina said, huh? But uh, Jackson's foreign policy really wasn't that important because we weren't a world power. We got no wars, nothing like that. Uh, he got in a little row with France over some money they owed us, but no big deal. Uh, but Jackson did have a secret foreign policy. He wanted the United States to expand. It was later on called Manifest Destiny. Jackson thought it was our Manifest Destiny means our obvious God-given destiny to expand to the Pacific Coast, to the, to the deepest insides of his soul. He wanted to take Texas and eventually California. Now, unfortunately for Andy, uh, Mexico owned those lands. Well, the, the Cherokees own land too. What did Jackson do there? All right, so using the same logic he used with women and with slaves and, and, and with Indians, he said, it's better that we white men take Texas and California than let the Mexicans keep it. It's good for the people there. We're going to do it not for our own sake. We're going to do it for the sake of the Mexicans living. Nobody ever asked them. All right? But this is going to be... And he had manifest destiny. In fact, while he was president, Texas, a province of Mexico, rose for its independence. It won. 
uh, a brief war in 1836 and declared its independence. Jackson wanted to admit Texas as a state, but Congress wasn't going to do that because Texas wanted to be a slave state. So Jackson did the next best thing. He recognized Texas as an independent country and committed our army, at least indirectly, to protecting Texas from a reinvasion by Mexico. Texas remained independent for nine years till 1845, and then on his deathbed, Jackson literally lived to see Texas enter the Union. Then he said, now I could die. And he literally held out in 1845 his last wishes when he died, his last statements. I mean this truly. He said, thank God I lived long enough to see Texas come in in the Union. And they said, any regrets, General Jackson? And he said, two, that I didn't shoot Clay and hang Calhoun. <laughs> nice guy. Uh, Donald, any regrets that I didn't hang Nancy and shoot Chuck? Okay. <laughs> Nancy, Pelosi, Chuck, Chuck. <laughs> Well, three hours ago, him and Chucky were friends again. I don't know what it's now. All right, but uh, anyhow, uh, Jackson, that was manifest. I think if I could go ahead of the game here, direct, and I can't point, unfortunately, because it's, it's, again, it's too bright there, but Jackson dreamed that we'd take Texas and all of that Mexican session area. Jackson lived to see Texas next, Right? Guess who was the leader of the Texas War for Independence? Sam Houston. Guess who Jackson's closest protege and best friend was? Sam Houston. Sam Houston had a bad first marriage. He was governor of Tennessee, the youngest governor, I think, ever in Tennessee history to this point. Everybody thought Sam Houston was on the fast track to becoming president. He had Jackson's blessing. No, he was closer to Jackson than he but Houston had a bad first marriage. He was in his mid-30s. He married an 18-year-old, and on her wedding night, something happened or didn't happen, whatever. Uh, don't get the wrong idea. Houston eventually had eight kids. His last one was born when he was 68. So it wasn't that didn't happen. All right. But anyway, his first wife left him in three days. Three days. How long the marriage? Like, three days. Okay. Uh, there you go. They weren't Catholic, so they could get divorced. See that? All right. But then, uh, well, Jackson, Houston then went and lived among the Cherokee. He just resigned the governorship of Tennessee, went to live among the Cherokee Indians, where they had a name for him called Big Drunk. Uh, what's, what's your nickname? Oh, yeah. What does that mean? Big Drunk. Oh, okay. And he was a raging alcoholic, believe me. Uh, but then Houston suddenly sobers up, has money, and winds up in Texas. How? Who gave him the money? He'd only get sober for one person, Andrew Jackson. And his third wife he got sober for, but those were the only two people. He died relatively sober. But Houston would never stop drinking except for those two people. All right? In fact, Jackson, another wish he had was that Houston be at his bedside when he died, and Houston was. And Houston had a baby at that time, one, his first child, his natural child, and he, he held that baby over Jackson's body. The baby was like a year old, and he said, look upon this man, the greatest man that ever walked the earth. You will say you saw his body. I was, he said that to his one-year-old. And a slave said, oh, Mr. Houston, Mr. Houston, Christ was the greatest man that ever walked the earth. He said, no, Joe, Joe, Andrew Jackson was the greatest man who ever walked the earth. That's how, so how does Houston wind up, who sent him there? Obama? I don't think so. All right. I think it was Andy Jackson. We don't approve it. And then because we annexed Texas, that leads to a war at Mexico, fought under Jackson's other protege, James Knox Polk, who was called Young Hickory. Jackson's name was Old Hickory. Polk was Young Hickory, so are they close? Uh -huh. So Polk later starts the Mexican War, no doubt about it. We win it, and we take all that red area. So if Jackson had lived to 1848, he would have seen his ultimate dream that we take California because he wanted to go to San Francisco and, and really see the, the bridge. Okay, but uh, no, I, that's not, you know why he wanted San Francisco? That was the best port in the western, or the western part of North America. The greatest port in the eastern part of North America is New York. We had that. So the greatest part, uh, port over here is San Francisco, and Jackson wanted that. All right, so that was his foreign policy. In a way, he did have a foreign policy. And then I'm going to make this very quick. In 1836, uh, Jackson did not run, but the Democrats nominated Martin Van Buren 
and uh, the Whigs ran three candidates in an attempt to stop him from uh, winning and maybe getting it in the House. The Whigs were not well organized yet. They didn't even have a convention in 1836. They were calling themselves Whigs, but they had very little chance. So in a desperate move, the Whigs ran three candidates against Van Buren. Har William Henry Harrison will win the next election. Uh, a guy named White and Daniel Webster and an independent from South Carolina again, Willie Mangum. Uh, and how many times I've seen that misspelled is Magnum. Remember the series Magnum? Uh, one of the greatest Jacksonians out of UCLA, uh, a guy named Hal, he kept calling Willie Magnum. And I mean, the guy's won Pulitzers and, and even uh, every award you could win. He's a great historian. I try to call him and tell him he was wrong on Mag. It's Mangum. He never called me back. Uh, <laughs> Neither did Obama or Trump. I can't understand that. Okay, but anyhow, uh, the Whigs desperately tried to run three candidates, hoping to get enough votes that they could throw it to the House of Representatives. It didn't work. Van Buren run, won in a romp. He actually got a higher percentage of the popular votes than Jackson in many ways, uh, when you consider it's a four-way race. And uh, Jackson, uh, then he, I'm going to give you one last trivia, see if anybody knows this, and you should. Jackson, in retrospect, could say, I served two terms, handpicked my successor, who was my vice president, and he won the next term. There's only one other man in American history could say that. I served two full terms and made my vice president the next president. Should know it. A lot of you people probably like him. How about Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush? How about that, right? Reagan, not only did Bush serve as vice, but for eight years, Van Buren was only for four. Uh, but that was, it almost happened to Clinton, but Al Gore uh, didn't quite win in 2000, and he blamed everybody, but I'd say that if I ever met Al Gore, I'd say, Al, quit crying, why didn't you carry Tennessee, your own home state, and then it wouldn't have worried about Florida. Uh, but he go, blah, blah, blah. okay, uh, but uh, that, that, that's the one that, where Gore had no argument coming. But anyway, all right, so Jackson, in retrospect, I have it there. Uh, some of you people are going to love this one. He paid off the national debt completely. For in the late 1830s, just before Jackson left office, the national debt was paid off for the only time in American history. We were in the black. No, not balanced budgets. He balanced every budget. But we paid off the what? National debt, the only time in American history that we paid off the national debt. Now, Trump will do it within three years, but... <laughs> want to bet? Okay, uh, but, but it's never going to be paid off. But he paid it off, and that we, for about 18 months, we were in the black. Unfortunately, what happened when Van Buren became president... Uh, depression hit, which we call panics in those days. We had a panic in 1819. We had another one in 1837, and that wiped out the, the cash inflow uh, to the federal government was, was lessened by the depression, and we went back into debt, and we never got out of it, and the Civil War then blew us way out of the water, and we've never, never looked back, okay? And we ain't gonna this year or next year or 10 years from now. Uh, if you think we are, I think you're wrong. Okay, there's 1832, there's 1836. Any, did I, I didn't go too fast. Everything okay? Okay. There's the ratings. There are the ratings. Right? I don't know if you agree with those. Why did Jackson, some, two people asked me why Jackson dropped between 215 and 217. Uh, the only thing I could guess is those, in those years, uh, there was a lot of Indian studies uh, a lot of Indian studies being done, and feminine uh, gender history became very, very, was big, but it became bigger. And for the first time, we had probably more female historians running around than male historians, and that might have been a factor. Uh, but also the slavery issue, okay? Uh, obviously, in the election of 216, race played a, 2016 race played a big role, uh, uh, abortion rights or abortion non-rights, whatever you want to say. So I think those two factors certainly didn't help Andrew Jackson. But to be fair, and I did say yesterday, I want to be totally fair, Jackson is a victim of presentism. We're judging him by the standards of today. It's not fair. 
I mean, yes, he owned slaves, and, and, and yes, he didn't treat the Indians very well, but what white men did. And he, yeah, he loved women, but he certainly didn't think they were equal to men. That's wrong, but back then, most women didn't think they were equal to men, unfortunately. And uh, the slaves, well, that's another story, too. But if you're going to condemn Jackson for owning slaves, how about Washington and Jefferson and Madison and Monroe and, you know, so on down the line? So I don't know, okay? Uh, there you go. Now, I don't know if you agree with those. Kind of. Those first four or five don't ever change very much. I would flip Truman and Jefferson. I would. And I might put Eisenhower above Wilson. In fact, I would put Eisenhower. In fact, I might put Jackson above Wilson. Might think I should like Wilson. He was a PhD in political science and history. But Wilson did a lot of bad things, too. He did a lot of good things. He deserves to be there. But not that high, I don't think. Mostly, Wilson didn't realize when he died. He, he had died, but nobody told him for about five years. And he tried to be president while he, you know. Uh, his wife ran the country, and I said, if I would have been alive, I said, good, because he didn't know where he was at. I'm sorry. He had a serious stroke. And with all the health problems I had, I'm not making fun of him. But certainly, he, if he loved his country, he should have stepped aside at a very critical time 100 years ago. All right, so be it. Now, what you've been waiting for. Both took a lot of grief for their hair, and neither changed his hairdo. Kennedy took a lot of grief when he was first elected because he had it too long at a time when men had the buzz cuts and all, and, but Kennedy cut it. He gave in to popular pressure, uh, especially when women told him to cut it. Then he cut it. Okay, but uh, anyway, uh, and, and so the hair, but seriously, rallies. Trump really was elected partly because of the momentum he seemed to have. Well, all these rallies, right? I remember saying that to some of my friends. Hey, this guy, ah, he can't win. Well, what the hell are all these people out there screaming? Something's going on here. You've got to be blind not to see it. Well, Jackson, while they didn't have mass political rallies in these days, it was considered undignified for a man to campaign for president. There was no man that really ran around the country campaigning for president until William Jennings Bryan in 1896, and then only he did it. It really wasn't until Teddy Roosevelt and beyond that people went out and campaigned around the beginning of the 20th century. But Jackson's rallies were, were spontaneous, and they often started with militias. Every state still had what? Militia groups. And because Jackson had such a heroic status, especially with the military, a lot of these militiamen would have rallies and parades. And they had to meet like once a month or once every six weeks for training. Well, they'd turn it into a drinking fest and a pro-Jackson uh, militia rally. And so rallies uh, really, really uh, captivated the country and, and helped Andrew Jackson, much as Trump's... Uh, even, to, even while he's president, Trump's highest moments are when he goes around and has these rallies. So there are some people those are things are going to work for, not. But Jackson didn't actually, again, go to these rallies, but for the time, it was the best his people could do. Uh, they were both outsiders who uh, opposed D.C. elites. In fact, you could argue, you could argue that the most qualified man ever to run for president was John Quincy Adams. Could argue that. And at this point, the least qualified was Andrew Jackson, even though he was a general, was a, briefly a congressman senator. And you could argue that the second most qualified president ever run for president was Hillary Clinton. Could argue that. And Trump obviously had no political experience, no military experience. Uh, on paper, he's the least qualified. And yet, who won? Jackson won and Trump won, right? So uh, they both ran as outsiders. And it helped the both of them. And what maybe the Trump people learned from Jackson, when he ran against John Quincy Adams, and the people said Adams is way more qualified, Jackson said, yeah, that's right. We want to drain the swamp. We want to get rid of these professional politicians. Put me in there. Sound good? All right. Did in 1828. Obviously did in 2016. At least to a lot of people. So they opposed the D.C. elites. Trump called it drain the swamp. Jackson called it rotation in office, right? Right? And Hillary Clinton's qualified. Yeah, well, that's her problem. She, that's all she ever did. And 
John Quincy Adams is called for. That's his problem. Okay. Appeal to the anti-market. Remember the market revolution? This change was going on in, in racial relations, in, in jobs, in urbanization. And, and a lot of the farmers, especially, and 80 or 85% of us were still common dirt farmers. These, a lot of these farmers felt uneasy about these changes. And Henry Clay supported the market revolution. He thought it was great for the future. Jackson, hmm. So a lot of people who were afraid of the future, who were really leery about what was going on. What's this newfangled railroad taking a place of horses? Wait a minute. Uh, how's come uh, I was an independent bootmaker and now I got to go work at a shoe factory? I don't like that crap. Uh, Clay said, well, that's good. It's going to be better for everybody. Jackson, oh, wait a minute here. So the anti-market revolution people uh, who were, were clinging to a, a life that they loved and that was maybe going bye-bye, uh, they definitely felt more comfortable with Jackson than with Clay, who was in favor of tariffs and railroads and canals and all that kind of stuff. Okay? They were both extreme nationalists. Uh, they, they both, uh, you know, very vehemently pro-American. Uh, uh, Jackson, just everything's got to be for America first. Uh, of course, in those days, that was the way it basically was. And Trump appealed into that. Let's face it, right or wrong, uh, he uh, he certainly is uh, make America great again. That was everybody laughed at that slogan when it came out. They're not laughing now. I, and Jackson was kind of the same thing. He might have said, "Keep America great, keep us the way we are," uh, but something similar. So they both appealed to patriotism. And remember, Jackson. I'll say it for the last time, January the 8th was still a national holiday, for God's sake. So how much more of a hero could you be? All right? Come on, Bill. Uh, Jackson, remember the kitchen cabinet, the unofficial advisors? Well, how about Jared and Ivanka? Right? Remember Steve Bannon? Remember him? Well, he had nothing much to do with Trump. All right. Uh, but, uh, but, but how about that, right? Jack, uh, Trump still calls his old buddies from New York a lot. and He admits it. So did Jackson. So Jackson had a kitchen cabinet. Uh, Trump's the first guy to openly make his daughter and his son-in-law official positions in the government. Uh, and he didn't unabashedly, he did it unabashedly. Hey, I don't care if you don't like it. It's what I'm doing. Jackson said, yeah, I have to have a kitchen cabinet because my first cabinet had a fire all of them. So I better depend on a kitchen cabinet. Could have put Peggy O'Neill in there, then everybody would have come to the meeting. All right. <laughs> they were both, had fierce media foes and friends. Trump obviously has Fox News, and he obviously has MSNBC, <laughs> and he's kind of declared war on CNN, which he calls the Communist News Network. That's not original, Donald, I hate to tell you, but okay. Jackson was so obsessed with newspapers, which was the only media at the, medium at the time. Jackson used to read newspapers like crazy. And newspaper editors, and like Trump watches TV now, all the news, yeah, sure. See the similarities? But Jackson, newspaper editors at this time were as famous as news anchors now. Who anchors NBC News? Who's on CBS? Who's on CNN? How about Sean Hannity or Bill O'Reilly or who's there on Fox, right? Okay. Well, in these days, people knew their newspaper editors. Quick, tell me who's editor of the New York Times, Los Angeles. You can't. All right, but, but in these days, people could, just as soon as they, you know, they could tell you who Walter Cronkite was or Huntley Brinkley in a day. All right, so they, they had both had fierce media foe and friends. Jackson was so obsessed with newspapers that he wanted a newspaper totally in his pocket. And he had his party form something called a Washington Globe. That was his newspaper. It's, he got a newspaper editor from out west to come back named Francis Preston Blair. And he became the most famous newspaper editor in American history until Horace Greeley in the Civil War era. Greeley's the guy that popularized the phrase, go west, young man, go west, even though he was born and raised on the sidewalks of New York. He never really said that. He quoted somebody else. But anyway, Francis Preston Blair, who remained a important figure in America right through the Civil War, and then his son became even more famous in, in many ways during the Lincoln years. 
But, uh, but Francis Preston Blair in the Washington Globe, that spoke for Andrew Jackson. I spent many hours in the Lehigh Library, I, I eat a dungeon, uh, reading microfilm in those days of the Washington Globe. What, a fa- what are you doing this weekend? Well, I'm going to be reading the Washington Globe on microfilm. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's better than having a date. What the hell? All right. Uh, so, uh, but, but, uh, but, yeah, the Washington Globe. All right. Promoters of executive authority, both of these lads, oh, they don't, they don't, because of Jackson's military background and because of Trump always being the owner of companies, not a follower, but the boss, you know, uh, they, they can't stand legislate. Why, why do you have to have committee meetings? Why can't you just do it? Well, what's this debate? What's this cloture rule? Uh, same with Jackson. Uh, to him, legislatures were women. Executives were powerful people. They could make a decision right then and there. There's the outhouse, use it or get out of it, Jackson used to say. I'm serious. All right? And when Trump, same thing. Well, what's all this, Mitch? Why can't you just get the damn thing passed? Simple enough. Break a couple Democratic arms. There you go. All right. Uh, but, but neither one could tolerate uh, legislative inaction. And both of them were strong executives. Jackson was clearly the strongest executive we ever had in peacetime until Teddy Roosevelt, probably. Uh, Only Lincoln was probably more powerful in any way, and he served during the Civil War. But Jackson had no wars or any great national crisis, and yet he was a very powerful executive. Again, he vetoed more bills than his six predecessors put together. He used a pocket veto. Uh, He fired his whole damn cabinet or asked him to quit just completely. He, he ran it in a military type style. Uh, and, 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 there was this, and I think I can understand a military guy having that frustration, and I can understand a businessman uh, kind of having that frustration, especially when you own the business. Of course you're going to want people to jump when you say jump. How high? When my wife says jump, I say high and way up. <laughs> you know, I say how high and way up. And I got <laughs> Their weakest support was in the Northeast. Hillary carried every state in New England, right? Carried New York, Pennsylvania. No, she didn't carry Pennsylvania, New Jersey. Okay, but uh, Trump's weakest support was in the Northeast, right? Strongest support in the South uh, and in the Mountain West. Not, not the West Coast, but uh, the Mountain West. And uh, Jackson would be very happy to see. Uh, Texas probably go for Trump. There you go. Uh, there. Now, contrast. Jackson was born into poverty. Trump won. Trump's daddy was very wealthy. Trump's granddaddy was very wealthy. Jackson wasn't sure who his granddaddy and grandmommy were. Remember, he was orphaned when he was very young. His two brothers died in the revolution. Uh, and his mother also died... Uh, basically being a nurse uh, in the revolution. Uh, Trump was born in extreme wealth. So was Kennedy. I mean, it's, most of our presidents were born wealthy. George Washington made money to two old American, uh, fashion American ways. He inherited it and married it. Uh, that doesn't make him evil. I mean, that's just the way it is, right? I shouldn't be jealous, but I am. Uh, <laughs> I have my faith. That's more important. <laughs> yeah, you buy that. Yeah, uh, you have a PhD, Bill. Yeah, well, I went to the I went to the Costco and tried to pay for my bill. But it didn't work. I have a PhD. Give it to me for free. No, you get out. That's piled higher and deeper. That's all that means. All right. Self education. Jackson was basically self educated. Trump went to the best private schools. Jackson said, "I went to the University of Adversity." I love that. University, he actually said that. I went to the University of Adversity, and he didn't particularly love college graduates, although there weren't that many running around back then. And of course, Trump went to elite private schools and eventually to the University of Pennsylvania, uh, Wharton School, and stuff like that, so there's no comparison there either, right? Trump actually started Fordham, but wound up at the University of Pennsylvania, and his daughter did too, right? My son just got his doctorate, not just, many years ago, got his doctorate from Penn, so I have a Penn tie on. And if people say, did you go to Penn? I say, yeah. (laughs) Who's going to know? All right. Jackson was rural. 
Trump was urban. Sidewalks in New York, for sure. Okay? Military fame for Jackson, made him president. Trump, business, and The Apprentice, TV fame. Right? Slight difference there. If Jackson would hold one thing against Trump, in fact, he wasn't in the military. I, I, I think he would. All right, Jackson, again, if you were in the military, he would never fire you. Uh, if a road could be argued that it was helped the military, he'd sign that road bill, remember? Uh, there you go. Jackson fought duels. <laughs> Trump doesn't. Okay. He'll file lawsuits. Uh, oh, Andy, he shot you. Hey, here we go. And remember, Jackson killed a man in a duel, arguing over Rachel and horse racing. And uh, he was shot twice, uh, once in a barroom brawl and once in that duel with Dickinson. Both bullets stayed in his body for a long time. The, the bullet that Dickinson put in him near his heart stayed until he died. He had another bullet put in him by uh, Thomas Hart Benton's brother. Thomas Hart Benton became one of his biggest supporters in the Senate for many years. Thomas Hart Benton led the move to expunge the censure. But when they first met, uh, Jackson had an argument in a bar with Thomas Hart Benton's brother, and Jackson shot Benton's brother in the rear end while he was running away. Uh, meant to shoot him in the back, got a little low, and Benton turned around and shot Jackson in the arm, and that bullet stayed in there for about 20 years. And finally, and here comes University of Pennsylvania again, Jackson was going north once to get a, an honorary degree from Harvard, which drove John Quincy Adams nuts. He said, that barbarian is getting a degree from my university? Uh, Harvard gave Jackson an honorary doctor. I said, God. I, uh, but on his way to Boston, he stopped at the University of Pennsylvania, and a doctor did remove the, uh, the bullet that Benton had put in him, but they could never dare try to fool around the bullet that was lodged very close to his heart. Uh, okay. Rachel versus... <laughs> what? You know, you get to be my age. Somebody said, which one would you like to spend a night with, Bill? I think I'd pick Rachel. Uh, <laughs> is it time for suicide? Yeah. Okay. It's an option. If I weren't Catholic, I'd do it, honest to God. I, I hope that didn't offend you. That's a good one, though. It's Rachel Maddow. Trump doesn't like her. All right, hope this one works. We just added it. <laughs> ah, damn, Bill. There's Francis Plesh Preston Blair of the Globe. Trump, or Andy's man. <laughs> there you go. It's on Hannity. Thank you. Now, it's a little early. Uh, I, I wasn't going to take any questions. If anybody feels, I don't, you know, just yell it out. We have a couple more minutes, uh, but I'm really, uh, I could take questions on the rankings, anything you want. Any? Oh, oh, that's why I wanted to end early. Thank you, Roberta, for having me this year, asking me back next year. I have a couple things. I could do one on Kennedy, if that would, no. Yeah. I could do, here's another one that was suggested, Teddy Roosevelt. You Republicans, all right. Uh, or Franklin, Teddy Roosevelt's, the, okay. Uh, David Bryan actually suggests that. Oh, all right, Teddy, it is. Go ahead. Yeah, loud. Tell us a little more about the Bank of the United States. Well, the Bank of the United States, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, thank you. The Bank of the United States handled all the government's money, and any bank in these days could put out paper based on its holdings. And therefore, the only currency we had that was accepted all over the country was the bank notes from the bank, right? That was our central bank. In essence, here's what happened. Okay, yeah, good. Here's what happened. When Jackson destroyed the bank, he gave the money to state banks, ultimately 89, all right? And they, but they screwed it up. So when, the, when Van Buren became president, 
he set up something called the independent treasury, where the government gave its money to no banks. It held its own money in private vaults like Fort Knox, public vaults, that became known as the independent treasury. So the government's money stagnated. They, it couldn't be loaned out or anything, and that was not good. That was the independent treasury. Now, when the Whigs came back in after Van Buren, they then start giving the money back to state banks. But then when the Democrats came back in, they reinstituted the independent treasury in the 1840s, and that stayed as our, the government just holding its own money, letting it stagnate until 1913 when Wilson created the Federal Reserve System which was the first agency ever to be able to issue bank notes that were legal tender for all debts, public and private. Read your money. This is legal tender for all debts. It's a Federal Reserve note, whether it's a $100 bill or one. All right? Now, the reason Wilson did not call the Federal Reserve the third bank in the United States is he was a historian, and he realized the trouble the second bank caused politically. So he said, we got to think of a different name, and they came up with the Federal Reserve System. But that's, in essence, the third bank in the United States. Now, I know there's some Canadians here. The Canadians, about the time of Jackson, decided to go, after, and certainly after they got their independence in 1867, Canada always went with more regulated banking, more government-regulated banking. And while we had zillion bank failures, Canada rarely did. I believe since 1923, Canada has only had one bank failure. We've had, like, 13,000. All right? And uh, we had 4,000 a year at times until the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation started in 1933-34. But the Canadians had something like that way back in the 1870s, and they never really had bank failures, just as an example. All right? So that, the Bank of the United States, though, had branches all over. It, but the trouble with the bank that made it unpopular, too, is it could compete with other banks. In other words, I could go for a loan to a private bank or a state bank in Philadelphia or the Bank of the United States. If I'm in New Orleans, I could get a loan off a state bank or the bank branch, right? Uh, so the bank had a lot, lot, a lot of power. Okay? Right? Okay. I have a question for you on the, on the trail of tears. Yeah. No. No, I, it, it, they were double-crossed. Um, they were supposed to get a lot of money for their land. They did get some. They're still getting some, technically. But it, 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 all right, it broke up families. The way it was done, I mean, they weren't put in airplanes or trains and moved to Oklahoma. I mean, they were marched. And so how could you? It was terrible. It was, it was mini-genocide. I'm sorry. Uh, would have, could have they coexisted with us, with white people, if they were allowed to stay? Or are Indians coexisting with us here now? Pretty well. They get a lot of my money. <laughs> and I was in Oklahoma for a while. It, I don't see any problem there. We don't know. It didn't happen. So we can't say that the Indians would have blended in as well as they are now. Can't say that because it didn't happen. And it's the same thing as, was slavery good? I mean, were the slaves better off here than over an African tribal war? Oh, maybe. But, but I think I'd rather be free and take my chances. And I'm, I'm not very brave, but I could run like hell when I had both legs. And uh, so wars didn't scare me until I start slowing down. Yeah, it was the guy from uh, uh, George, Georgetown. Yeah, uh, he, he who now hates Trump, by the way. He wrote a book on why Trump should be impeached. Well, come on, what's his name? Oh, God. He wrote a, bo a book on the election in 1928. He had, he, it's legitimate. He had been doing this for years. Uh, certain factors like how the economy's doing and all that. That's why the Democrats are chomping their lips now. Oh, we're going to clean up next year. Hey, if this economy stays good, you ain't. That's why one reason Truman pulled off the miracle of 48. Alan Lickman, 
Alan Lickman. Yeah, he, uh, he had these things that he was using since the 1980s, really. If this, you take these factors, like how the economy is doing, how unemployment is now versus when the guy came into office, and then whether the in, uh, incumbent party is going to win or the outside party. Yeah, and it, he just did that, and lo and behold, it came up Trump the winner. Yeah, but now Lickman is very anti-Trump. So if you're pro-Trump, don't exactly deify Alan Lickman. Oh, yeah, yeah, he's very liberal. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But people think he, he's a pro-Trump or he's not. In fact, his latest book is called A Case for Impeachment. Go ahead, yell loud. He more asked the people to follow the cause of Andrew Jackson than, he, than the, he followed the cause of the people. But he was a representative of the people. He, he came from the people. He, he, he was the first president who really was born into poverty. He was the first president born in the West. He, he represented to the common people that you now, maybe anybody, any white man, could become president. So did he, did he pass any major legislation that helped the common people, like expanding the suffrage or Social Security? No, but nobody would at that time. Nobody. You understand what I'm saying? It, all right, if I could give you, a, when you personalize things, you make it. I, I think the way people felt about Jackson was the way I felt about Kennedy. I still remember watching Walter Cronkite in 1960 declaring Kennedy the winner, watching it at like 3 o'clock in the morning Eastern time, when Cronkite incorrectly gave California to Kennedy. Turned out Nixon carried California when the absentees came in. But Walter said, Kennedy is now president. And you say, it's not the popular vote that counts, it's the electoral vote. Walter, it's electoral. You're getting a million a year, and I'm getting nothing. It's the electoral, Walter. There's no I in it. But I remember sitting there with my mother eating popcorn, 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm 14 years old. And she said, now, Billy, you could be president because we have a Catholic in here. <laughs> we were very humble people. Right, and I, if that's, I don't want that to be goofy, but I think that's the way you could look at a farmer kid in 1828 and say, if this guy made it with no education, born into poverty, orphaned, so could you. But again, he, if you judge him by present day standards, Roosevelt brought in Social Security and FDIC and unemployment compensation, but nobody, Henry Clay wouldn't have done that. Nobody would have done it in the 1820s and 30s, right? So I think he was a symbol. There was the, one of the best books written on Jackson was uh, uh, by a guy named Ward, Andrew Jackson, Symbol of an Age. And by the way, they were supposed to put a reading list out. Did they do that? Oh, I, I didn't have that in any alphabetical order or anything. It's just some recent books and old ones that are really good on Jackson. There's one on the bank war, one on his Indian policy. And I think Jackson gets a bad rap on the slavery and Indian stuff. I think it's tragic what happened to the slaves. It's tragic what happened to the Indians. But again, I don't think he should be condemned for that when you don't condemn George Wash and everybody else back there. Yeah. Yeah. It's a dirty word. <laughs> what? Now, the two the primary ways the federal government raised money was by the tariff and the sale of Western lands. Jackson actually favored a little lower price for Western lands. Henry Clay favored a higher price. So, yes, Jackson got a lot of money from the, the government did, but Jackson personally favored lowering the land price so white men could move into Indian territory more quickly. So there wouldn't be any chance of the Indians getting it back. So he, yes, the government got money from land, but Jackson favored cheaper land than Clay. Clay favored higher prices for land. If you, I could put it bluntly, Clay emphasized quality of life, Jackson quantity. Clay was afraid of expanding. Maybe we better take the land we have and make it better. Jackson said, grab the land while it's grabbable. So Jackson favored cheap land, but yes, he raised money primarily, and it would have been any president from the tariff and land sales, absolutely. Yeah, one, two more maybe.
The Globe. The Washington Globe. Oh, God. <laughs> well, every president after that had papers that were either pro or anti. But no other president ever had a paper that was created specifically by him to promote himself. No, none to my knowledge. But from then on, every paper, every, in those days, most papers, up until the Hearst papers, and they were very political, but up until the 20th century, almost all papers were political, either a Whig or Democrat or Republican, because you could only exist if you got money from printing on a side. And the gov if, you, if you were a Democrat and you had a Democrat governor, they'd hire you to print the state papers and the state records. So almost all papers were political until the 20th century. Very few independents because you needed that extra money. Circulation itself wasn't enough because you had to sell the paper so cheap and you didn't have a lot of advertising yet like you do now. So it's not now Trump has in essence Fox News and his opponents have MSNBC and really CNN if you're honest about it. Well, fine. I mean, but, but Trump doesn't own Fox News where Jackson, in effect, his friends owned the globe. Not he personally, but his friends did. Okay? Nah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Let me stay away from that one. I've, I've called the last few wrong anyway, so. Yeah. Well, thank you. And in your honor, sir, I will tell no more Canadian jokes. All right, look, uh, thank you, Robert. Thank you, all you people. I did say it yesterday. Thanks for letting me teach again. Thanks for letting me feel young again. And I, I really am going to look forward to next year. Teddy Roosevelt. <laughs>